Now, during the first week of July of this year, a heat wave swept over Quebec. The temperature soared to as high as 45 degrees Celsius across the province. During a single week, the provincial coroner recorded more than 90 excess deaths, people who died because of the heat wave. But don't be fooled. They didn't die just because of heat. All the people who died had one thing in common. They all lived alone, like Eleanor Rigby. Social isolation is an epidemic in modern society. It's a painful, silent, cruel epidemic. More than one in eight seniors live totally alone, in total isolation. That means they have not a single friend, not a single family member to care for them. These are the kind of people who die. The rates are even worse for people with disabilities and severe mental illnesses like schizophrenia. These are troubling data. And this is not just a social issue, it's a health hazard. Being lonely is really bad for your health. Um, it increases the risk of death by about 50% to be socially isolated. Increases uh, your risk of dementia by about 64%. Increases the risk of depression by even more than that. We hear a lot about the epidemic of obesity, but the epidemic of loneliness is twice as deadly. Now, it doesn't just affect people on the margins of society. Uh, it affects all of us. Uh, surveys that have been done in cities like Edmonton and Vancouver, wealthy Canadian cities, show that one in seven people describe themselves as, prof as profoundly alone at all times. There's lonely people in this audience. Uh, being surrounded by people does not protect you from loneliness. Uh, in fact, I should give you a definition. So what, what does loneliness mean to academics, to researchers? It means the perception of isolation. So it's a state of mind. You can't do a blood test to it, but you know when you're lonely, and you know it desperately. And every day, people are affected by this. So what, what can we do about it? What, what, perp, you know, what social measures can be taken to deal with these issues? Uh, there are many, but I should step back and tell you that, uh, you know, we should talk about why does loneliness exist? You know, it's such a cruel fate. Uh, it's so harmful. Why does it exist? And actually, there's a very good reason it exists. It's something that's kept us alive uh, through since prehistoric times. Uh, when you're hungry, that tells you you should eat. When you're lonely, that tells you you should seek out other people. Uh, pe humans are social animals. Uh, when you were a caveman, you couldn't survive very long alone. So this is built into our DNA to seek out people. But modern life has made it more difficult to do that. Uh, our social structures have changed profoundly. Uh, for time immemorial, people uh, were born and they died in the same town or the same village. They worked there, uh, they played there, they worshipped there, they found love, uh, they found solace. Uh, they didn't always like their neighbors and their family, you know, let's be honest, but they were ever-present. They were like a protective cocoon. Uh, and that's not the case anymore. Uh, society has changed. We've become much more prosperous even all over the world, but especially in Western society. Uh, prosperity is a good thing. It's allowed us a lot of freedom, a lot of benefits. We, we all uh, get to live in beautiful towns like Kelowna because we're prosperous. But it's also shattered our family structure and our social structures. Uh, about only, only about half of Canadians today uh, have five or more friends. And those friends are often too busy to see, just like we are. Uh, only about half of us have five close family members in our lives. And again, they tend to live far away. So these are, are real uh, and impacts on our daily lives. The, the not, that we don't always think about. Uh, an audience like this, you're a very knowledgeable audience, you'll be familiar with the concept of social determinants of health. So what that tells us, uh, this academic notion, is that what matters to our health is not medicine. What matters is having a good income, a roof over our heads, an education, uh, good food. One of the determinants is social connection. It's one of the most important ones, but we often forget to talk about it because we're not exactly sure how to measure it. It's a lot easier to measure your income than your social connection. But that's something we really have to put uh, more time and more value in. 
So how do we do that? How do we make people more connected? Now, if I was a motivational speaker, which unfortunately for you, I'm not. I'm a, I'm a print journalist. Moving two feet is an, an effort for me. I usually sit at a desk uh, like many of us do. Uh, but if I was a motivational speaker, what I do is I tell you all to stand up, hug the person beside you. Maybe they're lonely. Uh, I would tell you to go back home and meet your neighbors. You probably don't know a lot of your neighbors, but go meet them. Bring them a pumpkin pie. It's fall. I would tell you to go down Main Street and talk to the homeless person that you walk by every day without casting a, an eye their way. I might even tell you that uh, I've done that many times myself, and I've changed lives. I've saved people. That's what motivational people, speakers do. I tell you to buy my book, uh, Five Easy Ways to Solve Loneliness. <laughs> now, unfortunately, I don't have that book, and there are not five easy ways. Uh, it's complicated. It's complex to deal with this. Uh, essentially, what we have to do is change our social structures. We have to change our culture to adapt uh, to how we live. Uh, we have to essentially build community. So what is this mysterious thing called community? It's something that, as a health reporter, I actually write about a lot. Uh, community, uh, John McKnight is sort of the, the dean of, of community. He's a professor at Northwestern University in Chicago, and he has this definition. He says, uh, for some people, community is relationships. Uh, for some, it's a feeling. For some, it's a place. So from, for some people, it's an institution. All these things can be community. But the definition that Professor McKnight likes the most is community is a place where people prevail. Now, we have to ask ourselves, is that true of your community? Is it true of your city, of your neighborhood, uh, of your church, of your running group? Are they welcoming or are they inclusive or are they exclusive? That's what building community is about. Now, I'm going to give you, I got interested in this issue of, of loneliness several years ago, and I'll tell you why. It was because of two stories, and I'll tell you those stories very quickly. So, first I'll tell you about a Mrs. Chu. Mrs. Chu lived in suburban Toronto in a nice home. Uh, one morning in January, a few years back, uh, her lifeless frozen body was found just a few meters from her home in a very wealthy neighborhood. Uh, the night before, she had wandered out of the house. She had early dementia, and she couldn't find her way back home. Uh, she screamed. She banged on neighbors' doors. She clawed at their cars to try and get warm. She wanted to find a place to get warm. She set off their car alarms. And what was the response? The response was people closed their curtains really tight. They turned off their porch lights. They went back to watching TV. They went back to their computers. The next morning when police, when people discovered the body and police came and they interviewed neighbors, what did they tell them? Well, they said, listen, we didn't want to have anything to do with that crazy old lady. We don't know her. Why would, you know, it's not my problem. Uh, Mrs. Chu had lived on that street for decades. Uh, she died for the same reason that people died in the heat wave, because she was neighborless. Uh, the people who lived beside her were occupants of homes. They were not neighbors. We don't have many neighbors anymore. The second story is about more of an academic report. This report said that it was about children with physical and developmental and psychiatric disabilities. And it was looking at data about their lives. And hidden in that report was a little number that really jumped out at me. It said that three in five children, disabled children, had no friends, had never had a friend. Just imagine that for a moment. Uh, outside the classroom, we know we have inclusive classrooms now, but outside the classroom, nobody played with them. Uh, they didn't get invited to birthday parties. Uh, I could scarcely imagine a worse thing in life than a child who's condemned to being friendless and alone for their entire life. But again, that's the reality. And that's the reality not only of a lot of people with disabilities, but a lot of people who are poor. Poverty makes you six times more likely to be lonely than anyone else in your peer group. Now, why is that? Uh, the reasons are, well, you know that being poor is not easy, but it makes it even more difficult to connect. And in our modern society, we've commodified relationship building. So everything you want to do where you can meet friends, meet new people, it costs money. Uh, you want to do yoga class, dancing, go to a concert, uh, 
play hockey, uh, join a curling club. This is how we make connections. Those things are all out of reach for uh, people who are poor. And people are getting poorer in society. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. And not just economically, but friend-wise. You know, it even costs money to come to a TEDx talk to hear someone tell you how costly loneliness is. That, that's very meta. I'm not sure what to make of that. So what's, what's the solution to all this? The solution is what I alluded to a little earlier. We have to build community. And how do we do that? Well, we have to rebuild our social structures. We have to change our values. Uh, right now, we grossly underspend on places that bring us together. Uh, libraries and parks and uh, community gardens and recreation centers. Uh, we have to remove the barriers to those and we have to make them more inclusive. And I mean economically and physically inclusive as well. Uh, have all age groups. That, that's what's going to resolve this epidemic ultimately. Uh, if we want people to be healthy, they have to be a part of society uh, in every way. They have to be full citizens. And citizenship is about belonging. It's about having a voice. It's about having connections. And connections are so powerful. Uh, we can't have a healthy society without healthy people. We can't have healthy people if we throw many to the margins, one in seven, thrown aside. When everyone is included in society, they're not only healthier, but society is healthier, and we're all the richer for it. It's really enriching to have relationships, and I hope you'll make some new ones today. So I want to leave you with, uh, I think, the most important thing I've ever heard about loneliness, and it's a quote from Mother Teresa. And she said, loneliness is the most terrible poverty. Thank you very much. <laughs>